Can we trust? Trust. Let's talk about it on After the Art. Hello and welcome to After the Arc, the official after show for the Arc. I am Yel Teagle. And I'm Adrian Snow. Adrian, this yes. episode. I know. Oh my goodness. Lots of happens. Okay, so in this episode we have my favorite moment and we will get to that. Okay. But first, okay. I like I want to talk about Kabir because yes. Dr. Kabir reveals uh, to Kat that she has this addiction. Yes. And she is on the road to recovery yep. and tries to do an autopsy. Well, because she thinks she kills that guy, right? And so yeah. she's like heartbroken that she thinks she's responsible for it. And it's like, the dude was had massive internal injuries. <laughs> like, he was probably just going to die. Like, you can't beat yourself off about that. But I think a big moment for me with that is that she gives Kat the keys to the drags mm. and they start like a little ship rehab. <laughs> I don't know if it's good to give somebody who's already admitted that they too had a drug addiction sure. keys to the drug gap. <laughs> and I was like, maybe Strickland. I totally agree because Strickland is also like your second in command kind yeah. of when you need help. Kat is a reality television star. <laughs> okay, guys, she is not a therapist. You know, she's not a, a nurse and understands drugs. Maybe we're giving her too much to do. Maybe, like, just let her, like, you know, relax and maybe do spa days or something. You know, I've said from the top that Kat was the character I related to most. <laughs> okay. And I stand by it. Yeah. Right? She she shouldn't be doing stuff on the ship. You should be like, sit in the corner. You know what? Kabir, power to you. Do what you gotta do. Yeah. Trust who you need to trust. Speaking of trust. Yes. The trusts. Okay. Are awake. They are awake. And I... Talk to me. You seem to have thoughts. Put them back to bed. (laughs) Put them back to bed. They're weird. I don't trust them. Uh, You know, Helena just seems to be already scheming. And they kiss for way too long. I don't trust couples who kiss for that long. In public. Here are my thoughts. Um, I don't like Helena. I'm not a fan. No. She's sus. Very sus. But I also love a a strong, manipulative woman. I'm torn. (laughs) I do like a strong, manipulative woman when I'm on their side. Uh Uh-huh. But but I don't know. I don't trust that they're going to. Now I'm going to be saying trust the whole time. Yeah. Um... You can't trust trust. I can't trust trust. You can't trust trust. You can't trust trust. I don't think they're going to make moves that are going to benefit the actual arc. I think it's going to be moves that benefit them. That seems to be like how they've operated and will continue to operate. We also uh, realize that Felix has a past history with them and used to be their security. And even attempted to take a bullet for them. Yeah. Or did take a bullet, didn't attempt. He took a bullet. Right. Um, I think that this, all of this, like, backstory is so helpful and so important. It it does, like, open up the the world a bit. So now we can get, like, more history of, like, what's going on with them. Yes. Who is this Evelyn character that was able to, like, buy them out of their business completely and, like, lock the doors. Uh, So I'm curious to see that as well. Uh, I think one of the things that I'm, like really harping on Mm -hmm. and I can't I can't stop thinking about is the like DNA chamber trust tells Lane that it's a toolbox to create an ecosystem Mm -hmm. and I think that that is fascinating um, because you know we have people like Angus who's like I have super soil so I can grow us food yeah and trust was like yeah but we're also you need all these animals to like make the world work and also ties back to what Kat kind of hinted at that they want it's almost like e- eugenics humans tend to get a little touchy on the subject of genetics let's talk about the moment i've been waiting for okay the wibbly wobbly time yes oh we were jumping right to the end yes. yes so they finally activate the ftl yes and trust does try and warn them because he does understand technology he understands like the person who built it and that he rushed things and it does kind of create this like really great moment of of them jumping back and forth in time just by seconds or minutes and trying to figure out like where am i supposed to be where am i going how did we get here how long have we been here irrelevant 
Remember. Remember what? You were telling us to remember to do something. Was I? And so it was like really cool to see them kind of like trying to figure out uh, how to save the ship when they when their actual like inner time clock and physical time clock is out of order. I love it so much. Mm. It's so fun to see. And it's what I've been waiting for all season. Some, Timey wimey. Some wibbly wobbly. Wibbly wobbly. Timey wimey. Yes. Yeah. We we hit the FTL. It doesn't work. Time's messed up. I cannot wait to see how this affects things, how mm-hmm. this changes things, where this leads to. I hope we get more of it. You know, when we saw Arc 3, I was like, time travel. And and no. Yes. And now I'm like, D- okay, this. D- no. <laughs> but here we are. Wibbly wobbly timey. I love it. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing with FTL, which I, I appreciate that they show that it would mess up, like, your own inner time. It would have an effect of, like, trying to move basically carbon-based beings through through time and space is really difficult. And so having that moment of them kind of figuring it out, and I think it gives them an opportunity to trust, trust, which I don't know if I agree with, but it does... It does make them go, okay, well, he is an authority figure in terms of, like, understanding how the science works. I just feel like if he had told Alicia, this is what you do, Mm -hmm. she could handle it. Yeah, I think it's a bit of an ego thing or ego trip when he's like, I could help you, but okay, you just have to see for yourself. It's like, it's like, you're not my dad. (laughs) Like, just tell me what I need to be told so that you can, we can fix the situation. That's my favorite scene, I think, <laughs> of the whole... It's been eight like episodes of the that. Whole shebang. Yeah, that's it. Nice. But I also, like, I'm dying to know... Right? We got to see Alicia and Eva and um, Trust go to, like, fix the problem. Mm-hmm. I want to know what was happening on the bridge. Like, I want to know... And they're just sitting there and, like... Yeah, because, like, moving what... back and forth. I assume... Because, it, right, it's everyone on the ship. Yeah. What's happening in the mess? <laughs> I'm sure somebody's trying to eat. What's happening with people who are having sex? <laughs> Great question. Because, <laughs> like, I mean, we know that that is happening now. Yes. Just to tie it into uh, Eva and Bryce. Speaking of Eva and Bryce, we find out that there might be a cure mm-hmm. for the kind cancer. On Arc 3. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. Um. I, well, it was nice to have that moment of, like, in the time, and I appreciate that they talked about, like, yeah, the Earth is falling apart, but also in that time, there have been all these advancements as you try and figure out space travel. And so... Even just, like, the comment about the the anti-scratch glasses. It was like, oh, I didn't know that. That's really cool to know. My glasses are scratch-resistant because of research done by NASA in the 1980s. (laughs) They were trying to enhance spacecraft water purification, but (laughs) how cool is that? They have been able to figure out, like, a cure to Clampkins, which is, is really great to see, and I hope that they are able to cure him. So at the end of the episode, we have the reveal that Cat has a romantic relationship with trust. This was uh, unexpected, mm-hmm. uh, and I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> I would agree. I did kind of expect ex- expect it because Cat has been alluding to having somebody higher up that has allowed her to get on the ship, and so when he comes in and they start kissing, I was like, well, clearly that is her higher up, and so I'm not too surprised by it. I think what surprised me was that her higher up was Trust, who didn't know he was going to be on this ship. Yeah. Well, but she didn't know either. I think it was more of like, he probably was going to get on Arc 2, Arc 3. But also it was like, well, how rude. Because what if Arc 1, like, didn't survive? Yeah. (laughs) Like, then he's, like, willing to take that risk with her. All right, so as we wrap up our discussion Mm -hmm. of this episode, Mm -hmm. what are your three wow moments? Okay, so my three wow moments would probably be the time dilation uh, moment. So just the the movement, I thought that was really cool. Oh, gosh. Um, Bryce punching out trust. I thought that was very appropriate, and I liked it. Mm -hmm. And then Kat... Being given, like, access to the drugs. I thought that was just, like, such a weird, wow. Like, okay, we're going down. It feels like it's a nice setup for later down the road. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my moments are trust and cat. Mm-hmm. That Helena put them on the ship. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and of course, the wibbly wobbly timey wimey moment. Yes. Because I loved it so much and I want more of it. Nice. Yeah. But there's still so much more to talk about. So don't go anywhere. We'll be back. I want to talk about uh, episode eight to every single person matters because this is has my favorite like moment of the show the ftl Mm -hmm. wibbly wobbly timey wimey scene um and you got to be in it and i know that you're a big hoovian and so getting to see you wibbly wobbly um how was that (laughs) shot how did you do the like time jumps and the moving and the the slow-mo of the hands how was all that shot it, I think it essentially took like almost the whole day <laughs> doing those scenes because you'd have to move positions. They'd have like your past self, future self or present self. So we'd film. It was really interesting. You'd like do one bit and then quickly like run to the next bit and then you'll be like doing that bit then quickly run to like the next bit and the camera's just catching you. Um, so that's how it was done. Also green screen behind you, I guess, for the wibbly wobbly bits. Oh. But we were moving at a normal pace but then also like imagining <laughs> that we were seeing ourselves in and out of like time, which was right. very interesting to try and visualize. <laughs> so that's, I think how we did it, but yeah, we just have to like move from position to position and then try and do it in a very similar manner as well. So you can't change anything. So you'd like move to your next position, exactly the same position, same everything and just do that. <laughs> Oh my goodness. That sounds so stressful. It was, but also fun. <laughs> um, As an actor, anything stressful is fun. <laughs> good to know. I love that Alicia's always there to help and always will try and find a solution to something. So actually having my character involved and in trying to fix that was really great you were in that scene with we have trust and ava are they um are the actors whovians did they understand the the importance of the wibbly wobbly (laughs) i don't think that they're whovians now (laughs) um i think i'm the only major doctor who fan really (laughs) i know other people watch it i know dean is but no, I just love the fact I get to be in a space show where I'm traveling faster than the speed of light. There's essentially in that one episode time travel, <laughs> which is amazing. And because I've always wanted to be part of Doctor Who. So being part of this, I'm just like, this is incredible. Just it's it's very I'm still very excited and very what's the word? It's very surreal is what I'm yeah (laughs) how it feels because you said that you get the scripts um as they were coming out when you got the script that revealed that arc three was there did you think time travel was that your first guess no actually okay it wasn't I mean I don't know why I I because I my brain was like we're 100 years in the future we're not traveling at the speed of light so I didn't think that time travel had been invented (laughs) Sure. <laughs> um, but I did find it very surprising that there was a third arc because I thought that my brain just kind of went to everyone's dead. I like I knew there were the other arc programs probably out there, but I just kind of thought that we weren't exactly told what hadn't happened with Earth really. But I just kind of assumed that every we were the only ones out there, especially on the same line of path because we're on our way to Proxima. So to find another arc on that same path ahead of us yeah it was quite a mystery (laughs) I liked following like trying to find out what happened I literally remembered as soon as I finished reading a script I was like what happens next I need to know what happens next (laughs) yeah I mean that's how I am watching the show so (laughs) every episode I'm like it is (laughs) yeah (laughs) I think the show does a really good job of that like once you get to know who the characters are and you start following along with the characters literally as soon as the episode kind of ends you're like well what happens next what happens with this person what happens with that person what about that relationship and I really like that about the show I like that it's very character driven okay I have to say this uh there was a line uh when Eva says my head hurts and Mm -hmm. it repeats 
My head hurts. I have to admit, my head really, I was, my head really hurt it. I had a feeling like a balloon was here on my shoulders and it's about to explode uh, because it was so overwhelming. We were running around uh, from one spot to another and uh, changing places. And we, from time to time, from take to take, we weren't really sure if it's position A or B, or are we now in the future? Or because the directors really tried to explain it to us. Like, where are we? What is happening in, in that moment? So um, it was a nerve wracking. I absolutely love it. It's so fun. Um, and it I completely understand what's happening. And I, I think it's just the like most sci-fi fun that you could have. Um, we've been waiting. We've been waiting for time to get messed up. And so this was the moment. Yeah, I mean, it, it is a completely sci-fi thing. And it was, on the top of that, it was so much fun because we, we didn't know where are we going with it. And then it just, when, when we got into it, it was... It was fun, but on the top of that, we had to know where we are, which is a little confusing. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. That's why I asked. I can't imagine having to do that. That sounds very challenging. It was a nice fitness though. Oh, yeah. Really nice fitness. Yeah. We were running a, a lot. <laughs> so you guys didn't shoot it like once the first time like the first timeline and then once the second timeline you did all of the times at once we kind of had to mix those things because um if we are for example shooting uh alicia's sequence then eva has to be there for her in all the mm. timelines and that's that was the tricky part because uh eva and trust had to follow the whole story when we shoot, while we shoot Alicia, which was really crazy because then we were running around from spot to spot to be there for her, to actually make her feel confused and actually feel the, the whole atmosphere. And then, I mean, we, we had to do it separately for every each uh, another. Wow. <laughs> How long did it take to shoot that whole sequence? I believe there it was a whole shooting day. Oh wow. Just yeah. Wow. If I remember uh, correctly. Yeah. <laughs> I what I love also about that scene is that like it is the three smartest people. Right? Like you have trust who thinks he's the smartest person in the universe, Alicia, who's actually the smartest person in the universe, and Ava, who is also really very smart. Yeah, I think we we, we really uh, clicked together. Every each one of us had something uh, that that knows and uh, that contribute contributes to to the problem solving, which mm -hmm. is amazing. They they actually make a great team. I have my own feelings about trust, but otherwise, I would love the three of them to work together some more. Yeah, it would be fun. Yeah, it would be really fun. I mean, Alicia, I would say that Alicia and Eva have a really like special bond because mm -hmm. she's like a little sister and she's completely over the top about everything. And she really talks a lot and she's really pushy. And then you have Eva, which would really love to, to keep grounded. And she tries to keep Alicia grounded and to just teach her some of the things that uh, she may maybe doesn't know uh, or doesn't really realize and all the social skills. And I mean, there's a lot between the two of them and I love it. Oh yeah. I want so much more of them hanging out and, and you know, learning from each other and teaching each other. It would be great. Can't be a show in outer space without some costumes, so let's take a look at the costume department. Hello, my name is Ivana Vasic English. I'm a costume designer from Belgrade, Serbia. 
I studied costume design at the Academy for Applied Arts and Design in Belgrade from 95 to 2000. It was a five-year faculty. I graduated in 2000 at a department for stage costume. And ever since, and actually during the studies, I started working in mainly theatre, event design and uh, performances. So I made quite a big career in, uh, in theatre, which I'm absolutely adoring. And then some years back, my um, then, I suppose, boyfriend, <laughs> now husband, came to Belgrade and we started a production company. And ever since, the American producers decided to take me on board. So I've been decided, uh, designing um, American TV and film for the past four years, almost exclusively. So, from the perspective of costumes, uh, Dean uh, Devlin and Mr. Glasner had this desire to make it understated, which is very clever. So, uh, my wings were cut down a little bit, unfortunately, but then fortunately for the quality of the entire project, I was not allowed to over-design it, which I think is a really good decision. So, therefore, I had to find ways to design the world with very raw, and simple and minimalistic um, means and uh, tools. We decided with a production designer uh, that the palette, the color palette, should be very subdued and very um, understated as well uh, for the world in 100 years time in this storyline has come to a breach of existence and colors would not be so significant in that time anymore so in order to not make uh, the show look completely bleak we did use some colors but they were all very low i wear this like red jumper it's the first thing i have i ever wore on set it was the first thing i ever tried on in uh, costumes, and I just love it. I don't know, I feel really cool in it. They've added like our names and uh, our character names and like badges and stuff, and it just like you really, the costume uh, designer did an incredible job with just like making you feel like that character and like making sure that everything um, really informs what you're doing in the world that you're living in, which I love. I love when you go to a costume fitting and you just are like, Oh, I think I just found this character, and I feel like that definitely happened on this show. The most interesting bits of this design, for sure, because this is the first time I've been designing um, science fiction uh, in my life, uh, was actually dealing with the compression suits. I followed the uh, research from MIT by a scientist called Dava Newman, and uh, she has this fantastic idea of uh, building the spacesuits for spacewalk for the future in such a way that they're going to enable the um, astronauts to have a much greater movement, but also uh, is going to make the suit much lighter. The idea behind the bio suit, as they call it on MIT, is that uh, the fabric itself is multi-layered and then the lines that are obviously here printed and, and, and uh, sewn and sewn upon um, are all made in this, um, in this material that, uh, that has the ability to memorize shapes. So it would, it would actually um, enclose down to the shape of the body. Everything is made here in Belgrade. I was, uh, <laughs> for days, I was doing the, the, the print preparation for all these lines to, you know, to make sure that they're going to be in order. This costume is the uh, EVA costume. That means extra vehicular activity. That's for when you go to space. Um, the helmets gave us a headache because Serbia is great in uh, traditional materials as in iron and uh, wood and leather and stuff like that, but plastic not really. <laughs> so we were fortunate enough to have a really great 3D designer who had a really great co contact in Chartrek. So little factory in Chartrek managed to manufacture uh, these uh, helmets in the shortest period of time up to the greatest standards. When you come to the Ark One, where we spend most of our time in this season, uh, you get to see a lot of people in these jumpsuits. Um, uh, they were designed by me and made by local factories. This was worn by a lead actress, 
um, Christy Burke as the character of Garnet in uh, one of the flashbacks when they were boarding. This is the same scene when they were boarding the ship. Um, I decided that in the future they're going to have uh, shoes that are going to be a little bit like Balenciaga. And we made socks and then we put them over shoes. My department thought I lost my mind, but it looked really nice. Was, I felt a little lost, if I'm being honest. And then as soon as I went to that costume fitting, I like wrote Ivana, I was like, oh my gosh, I think I know who Garnett is now and I'm really excited. Oh, wow. It's just something like, I feel like what I loved about her when I first ever read it is that I thought it was a man. So when I first ever read the pilot, I thought it was a man. And then I was shocked that they wanted me to audition for Garnett because she just, it doesn't read like a woman, you know, or, or our classic female lead. Um, and so, there's something about those costumes that really kind of, I was like, okay, I can do this. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. And then the endless helmets, we have about 140 pieces of those. There is a little bit of homage to the Blade Runner. Oh, there is my husband as an actor. And uh, you can see the uh, full EVA look. That's also great. One of the great points of this is that whenever I have the opportunity to dress somebody in some hu human <laughs> clothes, some civilian clothes, I tend to choose local designers, um, which uh, are compatible with the style of the show. So yes, there is again, once again, a lot of Serbian designers in this show. What is your favorite costume that you get to wear? Oh, my shoes. Kat has these shoes that she wears all the time. Um, and they're like these retro lace-up platform wedges. And they look like roller skates. I, I like all of these costumes. Um, the last show I did, I was in leather up to my neck and had swords. So I couldn't even sit down because the swords would stick into the chairs and stuff. This, I can move around. It's comfortable. So you prefer... And it's got pockets <laughs> so I can hide my screw. <laughs> hide my phone yeah. sometimes. Yeah. Right, so you prefer not to be in head-to-toe leather gear? In the sun, in the, the middle of summer, absolutely. I'm generally quite lucky if they put Bryce in clothes. <laughs> so uh, I, don't well, have, then. I don't have that, many, that much to choose from. It's a green like jumpsuit with a little pink sports bra and little tan boots that I wear in eight and nine. That's it's just so cute. Like when I first got to Serbia and was doing my costume fittings, I tried that one on along with a bunch of others and I was like, I need to wear this. Like I was like, who do I have to talk to <laughs> to make sure? Because we tried on a bunch and I only wore a couple, but I was like, I need this green jumpsuit. Like, I'm like how, now I'm like, how can I um, convince them to let me keep it? Where to start? Alicia has the most amazing costume. Um, I'd say my favorite costume is the one I've worn recently. So. I'm just going to explain the whole thing to you. Please. They're these bright orange trousers. They are gorgeous. They're like cargo, but like jeans. And they're just so beautiful. Bright orange. Uh, so everyone can see where she's going. And then it's just this top that looks like it's inside out, but it's not. So I'm like, fashion. <laughs> and the thing that I desperately want to take home with me are boots. Like she's got these like platform boots and they're black and they're just, oh, they're so pretty. Do they pull on or Velcro? Oh, they pull on with a zip. Oh, yeah. Fascinating. It's so pretty. I love her <laughs> costumes. Like in one episode, she's wearing jeans, like normal, just blue jeans. And it's so out of place, but it weirdly works as well. Like, I love her outfits. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, there was definitely kind of like a, a staple mm -hmm. of doctor's, you know, uniform. Um, but I... Like, I am somebody who have, has never been fashionable, but has always wanted to be. And our costume designers are incredibly fashionable. So even, like, the functional, like, pants they would have me in would be, like, I would be like, I would wear that every single day. <laughs> um, and then also my shoes were, like, it was like a hug for the feet. It was so <laughs> comfortable. Okay. Do you feel like you, uh, you don't feel like the character's complete until you're in full costume? A hundred, yeah, hundred percent. I think there's a whole process of like, you know, I have a playlist for her. Oh. So I'll start, you know, at the beginning of the day by like listening to the playlist and then depending on the scene, I'll pick certain songs. Um, and then the whole kind of act of getting into costume as well. Um, there, There is something quite uh, 
I don't know. Uh, spiritual sounds like a like a, but th there is something about that for sure. I think that's beautiful. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> Ryan Adams talks about growing the character of Angus. I am Ryan Adams and I play Angus on the Ark. He's literally just a kid, like one day he's, he's, he's playing video games with his friends on Earth, having, you know, just a normal life and, and the next he's, he's being shipped off to space, you know, on this opportunity of a lifetime and it's gone completely wrong and the fact that he's just a lot like myself in a, in a way. He's literally just a kid, so you put him into a scene with, with Lane or, or Garnet or, or Bryce, like it's, you can see the dynamic is so like, so different. So it's like putting, it's like a fish out of water, do you know what I mean? It's completely not his vibe at all. So yeah, it's, it results in some really funny scenes. How do I prepare to play Angus? A lot of research into horticulture. I didn't know nothing. I didn't know nothing about horticulture or, or gardening at all, but um, I'm quite lucky. I have a friend of mine back at home who, uh, who's, a, who's a big fan of gardening and knows a lot about the horticulture side of things. So every time I have a question, I can, I can go to him. But yeah, it was a lot of reading, a lot of watching YouTube videos, a, a lot of just surrounding myself with this world. Because he's a genius, you know, Angus is a, he's a genius in math, science, anything to do with plant science, horticulture, agriculture. So I really wanted to sort of step into his mind in a sense where I could kind of understand what he was, you know, doing in these scenes, what he's talking about. Yeah. Alicia to Angus is home, I think. I think Alicia really reminds Angus of his time on Earth and... I mean, Alicia would fit into his friend group, you know, she's, she's so much alike, like, they're so much alike. So, I mean, I mean, she's a nerd, so, I mean, that's immediately fitting for him. Um, when, when he's alone with her, when, when he's, I mean, when we have scenes together, it, he just feels like he doesn't need to do, do much to, to impress people, to like, you know, when he's having scenes with Gar Garnet and like, he wants to impress, he wants to, you know, come across as, as, as a, as someone who can do the job, who can really, really do the job. But with Alicia, it's like, he's just, it's just a friend. It's just, it's like he's talking to someone from, from one of his friend group in, on Earth. He's, yeah, she's, she's comfort for Angus, I think, for sure. Oh my gosh, he, he brings a, he brings a lot. He, br <laughs> he brings a lot to the Ark, absolutely. Um, I mean, he's their, he's their food, food source, essentially. Without, without Angus, he, um, the ship would be, I mean, without anyone, really, the ship would fall apart, but, um, you know, to, to, to have, to be hungry and, and, you know, to really starve yourself will, will completely change your mentality and, and, and weaken everyone. So uh, to have someone who, on the ship who, who can feed everyone and keep everyone healthy and, and fit, um, I think is very important. Um, yeah, I mean, he's literally the only, expert horticulturists left on the ship. So, um, yeah, I think he's very important. Yeah. <laughs> if, I, if I don't say so myself, do you know what I mean? <laughs> I, I guess with, with anyone, with me as well, once I've spent a lot of time with someone, everyone comes out of their shell a bit. So yeah, with these later episodes, I really wanted to show that he, he, he has come out of his shell. He's become more confident with everyone. I mean, if you watch episode one and then like watch one of the later episodes, uh, you should see a completely not different character, but a clear shift in in his in his behavior towards other people for sure. Yeah. We brought Richard Fleischman to the studio. Check it out. In episode eight, we get to see them, uh, Ava and and Bryce together, intimately. Yeah. Um, and we've talked about how small the DNA room was, but yeah. these these bunk beds <laughs> seem even smaller. Yeah. They were incredibly small. It's kind of hilarious because that we're going to spend a day in this kind of coffin-sized thing. And we went on a recce with the director who was doing that block. Or she, we got to the bed and we went, we should just do one look at me. <laughs> and she was like, yeah. And then she went, do me a favor, just lie down in it. And I got in and then there was like no room for anything else. And we went, how are we going to fit a Tiana in there as well? Uh, so they did some kind of movie magic and ended up shaving off the top of one so that they could get a camera 
over the top and shoot it like that. But it was obviously very, uh, <laughs> very close quarters. Right. Yeah. Um, okay, so they they removed the top bunk to make room for two people. And for the camera. Yeah, yeah. so that would be... Because otherwise, because you get two people in there, what are you going to do? Film, like, the side of someone's shoulder? There was just no... Because they were literally, like, proper bunk beds. So they made a special made one that they could get a camera and all of that stuff. And you guys get a special bed. We got a special, special bed. bed made. Nice. The yeah. ship is strong. <laughs> ship is too the strong. Ship is too strong. <laughs> Tell me about this writing writer's room because it is via Zoom. This year it was via Zoom. Yeah, which is interesting. <laughs> yeah. What are the challenges of writing uh, via Zoom? You know, it, I actually liked it. Um, from a technical perspective, I liked it better than doing it in person. In person, you're usually writing on a big whiteboard mm-hmm. or you're putting cards up on a cork board. And so to make a change is a pain in the butt because you have to scratch it out or just throw the card away and rewrite it and move all the other cards and then you know, move all these down to put this one here. We were doing it on the computer, on a computer program that simulates that, but literally makes it so you can cut and paste and move things in. and. And we're all looking at the same one, and we can all show each other what we're doing. I mean, one of us can say, what if we try this? And, and they do it, and you look at it, and you go, no, and you do undo, and it goes back. You know, it's just technically it's easier. It's harder s- sort of sociologically. There's something about being in a room with everybody you're working with and batting stuff around, and that's harder on Zoom. With everybody essentially being responsible for different episodes, how do you make sure that the, the character's voice stays the same well i i run all the scripts through my computer when when they're done just for that just to adjust some voices and move things around to make them all consistent but you know these writers have have been there from the beginning also so they know the voices pretty well i don't have to do much Well, let's talk about uh, episode eight, Every Single Person Matters. Uh, This is where we get the big reveal about cat and trust. Um, Yeah. Scandalous. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, she is so scandalous. I mean, it's it's surprising, but it's not that surprising when you know cat. (laughs) Right. Um, How early did you know about who was playing trust? And did you have an image in your head about what trust was going to look like? Um, I don't remember when I found out who was playing trust. I knew that they were after some sort of like Steve Jobs-esque kind of person. So yeah, I had a kind of similar image in mind. Yeah, I don't remember when I found out it was Paul specifically though. Yeah, and did you guys spend time together, build chemistry, like really, you know, deep dive into this history the characters have? Yeah, of course. That's the prerequisite, I think. We we talked about the affair and how it came about and why and what these characters meant to each other and um, and the dynamic between them so that we were on the same page. So, we, yeah, we had some really good conversations about that, which was very helpful. We are talking about episode eight, Every Single Person Matters. I am here with Rebecca Rosenberg, the writer of this episode. Hello. Hi. <laughs> okay. So this is one of my other favorite episodes. Excellent. I love to hear it. <laughs> we have the wibbly wobbly, timey wimey oh, stuff. Oh, yes. Yes. Um, how do Great. you write wibbly wobbly? Uh, really, really difficult. It was really hard. <laughs> um, we knew that we wanted to do that fun action sequence at the end with the time going haywire. And when I sat down to write it, I literally stared at the page and I was like, how do I do this? <laughs> like, yeah. because you want it to be visual. You want the characters to like make sure that they both understand what's going on and don't understand what's going on. You know, I watched some old like other references of like other things that have done wibbly wobbly time stuff. I think we talked about something from Star Trek. I can't remember exactly what episode. And just looked at like what were the visual cues that other stuff has used. Mm. And so we decided that we really wanted to do this like playing with the light and the like shadows of the people and the future. Like so we see multiples of them. And then getting into it, it was just tracking like okay there's a past present and future of each person (laughs) and just which ones are at which point in the story um and once we decided that 
the way that to get through it was if they just focused on what their goal was that helped. So it's almost like I wrote it sequentially first and then I went back and I like copy and paste it and retrofit stuff where it needed oh, to go. Yeah. That's amazing. It was hard. <laughs> yeah, it sounds very challenging. But it was fun. It was really fun. I love doing that kind of stuff. Like that's why I love writing sci-fi because you get to play in a playground that's has like no limits you know that's the best part <laughs> literally time yes is mixed up and like i mean a lot of this stuff we're pulling from real world science fiction issues you mm-hmm. know like what could happen if we actually traveled faster than the speed of light and we did it wrong um, and so I think that's why you see these kinds of things in sci-fi stories, because everyone wants to know what those answers are. And so we decided to give our version. <laughs> yeah, I absolutely love that. Um, it was so fun to watch. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've been waiting for like time yeah. to be messed with. Yeah. And it took us, what, eight episodes. Yeah. <sighs> <laughs> you know... It, it took it took me too long. It was too long. I waited too long. <laughs> you had to. We had to earn it. We had to earn that point because I think, I think like, the great thing about this show is that it it's science fiction, but it's so much about the people and the characters, and it's these strangers thrown together. They're not supposed to be in charge, and they have to figure out how to do things. And so we wanted to get to the point where they know each other enough. They know like their quirks and how they work together and how they don't work together. To really throw them into the deep end of, okay, now you have to deal with the deep science fiction weird timey wibby wobbliness. <laughs> sure. Fine. I'll allow it. That makes complete Thank you. sense. We appreciate it. <laughs> um, so in this episode, we also have uh, kind of a memorial for um, arc three for yes. the, the characters. I want to ask, because it feels very odd to me that this is the show's set 100 ish years mm-hmm. in the future mm-hmm. and arc one is four years out from that so 104 years right right from now <laughs> ish give or take ish because yeah. also the, yeah it gets weird when you get with space travel right, right. and how fast they're traveling time like related to how fast earth is moving it gets real weird sure <laughs> the timeline gets so minimum 104 years yes yeah exactly <laughs> um so we have this memorial, and there's this scene with a clergy member. Mm-hmm. Um, and I can only assume that this far into the future, with this many different types of people, that this is like a non-denominational clergy member. Yeah, yeah. That's definitely how we talked about it in the room. Like, the we don't we don't get super into like what are what what's everyone's religions a hundred years in the future? Sure. Like, how do people people feel about religion as the Earth is? like slowly deteriorating like i think there's that's a whole other season of television that can be made for sure um but we did feel like going on to these arcs which in itself has a biblical you know history like the word like there would be someone there of faith and it's we chose to do it non-denominational to represent all the faiths Um, I think some people will really resonate with that and some people might not. Um, but it felt like there had to be someone there to be sort of that voice of like loss and Mm -hmm. to help them grieve because that happened like throughout the season, like people are lost and they do have to grieve. Um, and so I think in this scene, we really wanted to like personify that and show collective grief, you know? Yeah, it's, yeah. you know, the show is dealing with uh, themes of, you know, loss on the individual scale. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, we start the show off with some deaths. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then we finish the first episode with even more of them. Yes, yes. So, you know, of course, and now we've got arc three and we've all these all these dead bodies. Yeah. Um, including Strickland's uh, husband. So, like, to see that makes sense. Yeah, and I think, like... Another big thing that we talked a lot about is that every life matters, Mm -hmm. like that they know that there are not that many people from Earth left, like humanity is dwindling. And so it felt important to 
you know, make that point in this episode after we had just lost so many people from the other ship and they're like seeing it. They're confronted with it head on, you know? Of course it matters. Every single person matters. Thank you so much for joining us here at After the Arc, the official after show for The Arc. If you want to keep the conversation going, give us a follow on Instagram at After the Arc. Until next time, I'm Yel Teagle. I'm Adrian Snow. And we'll see you next week. 